Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the um, Public Oral Health Innovations Conference 2016. Exciting. Um, yes, I am Julie. You don't have to say the rest of my name. Um, and we did have a weekend in Coober PD, which we'll talk about, but probably not today. <laughs> um, it was lovely. Um, so I uh, work in, obviously, as soon as I open my mouth, you know that I'm not from here. And I work in California. And our organization, <coughs> excuse me, is two acute hospitals, a cancer center, an eye hospital, and a heart hospital, and about 78 clinics. We see about just shy of a million patients a year in our clinics. And I'm responsible for the operations, but I'm also responsible for experience for the entity. And what a better place than an innovation conference to think about innovations and evolution of the concept of experience like um, Dr. Deb mentioned. So if you think about what we've been through in healthcare in regards to experience, we first started talking about customer satisfaction. Some of you remember this, we borrowed some things into healthcare and we called it customer satisfaction, but it didn't suit us because patients aren't really customers. We're not selling them shoes, right? We care about their health. We have um, relationships with them. So maybe some of us said customer satisfaction doesn't work. It doesn't fit in healthcare. Then we started calling it patient satisfaction. Some of you might still call it patient satisfaction, but patient satisfaction doesn't always sit well with us because we realize if we're telling a patient that they need an extraction, they not, might not be satisfied with that. But we had to be able to make sure that the experience they had when they were with us was healing and would contribute to their overall health. So we kind of ditched that term and started talking about patient experience. Now here's the deal, and we still talk about patient experience today, but I want to get us get our heads around some innovative thinking around experience. Uh, Dr. Deb mentioned this, is that when we started working on patient experience, we may have done that to the detriment of our team member experience. And what may have happened is our team member said, and our clinician said, you know, you're all about this strategy and this technique for the patients, but my experience isn't so good. And then what we have to realize is really how we experience each other is how the patients then experience us. It's very difficult for any organization to have an awesome patient experience if their team member and their clinician experience is poor. So I invite us to consider, as you heard mentioned today, that we can think about experience big E, I call it big E experience, which is everyone's experience matters. And this, this invites us to shift our thinking from tactics and strategies that are focused just on patients to tactics and strategies that are more focused on culture. So last year, a bunch of Fortune 500 companies got together and they mentioned culture 29 times in 90 minutes, but they didn't talk about what they could do about it, they didn't talk about what it means, they didn't talk about how do we change it. They just said culture, and people talk about culture, but they don't think about how to disrupt it, how to create a new culture, how to disrupt your old culture so a new culture can grow. So here's the return on investment for culture work. Culture impacts interprofessionality. It's a really cool word for teamwork. And if we have a culture that isn't contributing to us connecting with each other, having relationships with each other, good handoffs, good handovers, good communication, our interprofessional practice suffers and our patients suffer. Experience is deeply impacted by culture. Experience of the patients, experience of team members, experience of our clinicians, experience of families and the communities of how they experience us. Really hard to run a business, really hard to run a healthcare system if nobody wants to come to you. Really hard to run a clinic if no one wants to work in it. Culture deeply impacts quality and safety. There's a pretty good body of research right now that talks about um, you can't really get the kind of safe quality behaviors consistently that you want if you don't have an engaged workforce. And then of course cost. Culture, uh, poor cultures, experience, and you've all, you've all talked 
a lot about this with me since I've been here. Um, workplace, uh, respect in the workplace, turnover, recruitment and retention costs of clinicians, recruitment and retention of, of patients. So culture impacts a lot of things that have outcomes that we really want. So how do we change culture? So about four years ago, as I looked at this, I became very curious about how does one change culture? How does one disrupt the culture they have? And so I read all the literature I could find. Yes, there was some crying involved. There was some carrying on and looking through tons and tons of research papers to say, when we put something into place in healthcare, when it doesn't work, why doesn't it work? And there must be someone else besides me in this room that has tried to implement something in patient experience or safety and quality, went home for the weekend, came back, and your strategy was gone. It disappeared. You implemented it, and it never, it never stuck, it never took. So I got very interested in this, and I looked at things like handovers and hand washing and a lot of safety and quality strategies. And when I looked at them and said, OK, when they didn't work in a culture, why didn't they work? When they didn't work, why didn't they work? Because someone could take a strategy, they could put it in in their hospital, and it would work. You put the same strategy over here, it wouldn't work. And I got very curious about that. And so after about four years of, of deeply looking, going down the rabbit hole and looking at these things, this is what I found out. That our strategies <coughs> in healthcare mostly don't work if the culture is too hierarchical or too fear-based. Also, if it's too punishing, rigid, too much intimidation, there's too big of a power differential, the chain of command is too rigid, too much discomfort, too challenging. So as someone who really would like results, I had to try and get my head around, OK, if this, if this is what the elements are that don't allow us to get the results we want in healthcare, how do we change that? So the first thing is, is to define culture. So people talk about culture all the time, and mostly they define it as um, how we do things around here. That's not an actionable definition. That means it's how we do things. I can't do anything about it. Whatever. If we define culture as how relationships are structured, and we have relationships in healthcare, this is a good definition for us. Relationships defined as how relationships are structured. What that means is how my relationship is with you and how my relationship with is with you and how my relationship with is you defines our culture, which means I can impact the culture. So it's a very actionable um, uh, definition, and it also lets everyone be empowered. So if we define culture as how relationships are structured, we get some insight into how we can shift our culture. This is my favorite slide. Every time I see it, I get very, very excited um, because this is our beginning to understand how to disrupt current cultures so we can grow the culture that we want. So all cultures exist on a continuum. And these can be your cultures in your school. This can be your cultures in your um, workplace. It can be your cultures at home, cultures in government. And all cultures exist on a continuum. And at the far end, of this continuum of any culture are domination cultures. Now, don't get, don't get turned off by that word. You can call that anything you want. You've called these kind of cultures things before. Fear-based, top-down, rigid, hierarchical. So at that far end, any culture is a domination culture, and those relationships are structured around control. So those relationships are structured around, I need you to do this. I'm not growing you. I'm not nurturing you. Do it. And the values are really about winning and losing. The values are who, who is over who. And the stories and beliefs reflect that. So the stories and beliefs in a highly domination culture, you might have heard them in healthcare. A patient wanted something. I just told them, there's no way we're going to do that. We have a lot of um, cultural issues with people on our phones. It seems to be that our people don't really want to get our patients in to see us. They don't want to. Do you ever have that? Patients call in. Hmm. I said, did you get that patient in? Oh, they couldn't come in this day. I'm like, move things around. No, can't do it. Stories and beliefs, a very domination culture. So that's one extreme of the culture. And then as a culture moves along, they move more toward 
power with or partnership cultures. And you notice the words we use at UCSD are power over and power with. Those are the words we choose to be able to talk about our culture. And at the other end of the culture are partnership cultures. And those cultures have relationships that still have hierarchies, but they're hierarchies of learning. They're hierarchies of nurturing and mentoring. And the values are about caring and empathy. And the stories and values, the stories and beliefs in those cultures are about helping and healing. So it makes sense when you look at this that healthcare would be more toward a partnership based culture, or we would wish it to be. I gave this talk to, um, I don't, do you call them residents, surgical residents, surgical learners? What do you call them, fellows? Do you, what do you call your learners? Registrar. Registrars. So I gave um, a, this talk to our surgical registrars at UCSD, and I was giving this talk, and I said, where do you think you are? And I had about 20 registrars in the room, and I had um, some of our attending uh, uh, surgeons in the room, and they were really quiet because they're afraid. And then they said, we're that way. And I said, how far that way? And they said, how far does that arrow go? <laughs> True. Um, so when you look at cultures on this scale, you have to understand a couple things. That in a highly domination, power over, fear-based culture, there's some things that don't happen. Um, respectful workplace doesn't happen there because that's where the isms live. You know what the isms are, you talk about them all the time. In a heavy power over culture is where racism lives, rankism, sexism, genderism. I learned a new one from some of my team members last week, favoritism. All the isms that want to make you somehow believe that you're not as important as me. So far end is where the isms live, far end over on that end is where bullying lives. It's where sexual harassment lives. It's where um, issues with uh, disparities live. And then as you move um, into a partnership model or a power with model, that's where um, just culture lives. That's where um, respectful workplace lives. So all cultures exist along this continuum. And so then the question becomes, how do you move along that continuum knowing that the results you want are more in a power with culture. So I did a, a fairly robust study and asked people in healthcare, um, leaders primarily, where do you think your culture is in your organization on between one to 10 from domination to partnership? I asked them, and what do you think the leaders said? Well, it's all right from up here. Did they? Yeah, I said, eh, it's okay. It's okay, it's all right from up here. It's, somewhere in the middle. And so then I thought, well, that's probably not a very good answer. The leaders might not have good insight into their culture. So then I asked team members. I asked technicians and nurses and food workers. And this is what I found out, that healthcare culture is indeed a culture of domination, power over, and this impacts our patients patient experience, that thing we want to work on, and the thing we didn't look at yet, which was culture. That leadership style deeply impacts culture. However, bad news, leaders are sometimes acutely unaware of culture and domination tendencies. Because once again, everything looks fine from up here. So we need some intentional, intentional strategies to help us disrupt culture so a new culture can grow. Awareness of how people relate to one another a culture is a first basic step toward culture change. I'm hoping that in this innovation conference, when someone talks about culture, that the first thing now that pops into your head is, how do you define that culture? And have you done an assessment so you even know where your culture is? Because if you don't really know how relationships are structured in your culture and you're not aware of it, you're probably not gonna change it. Culture is not like a, something we swim around in like a fish in a bowl. We actually can impact it by how we structure our relationships with others. So I actually asked, so these are two very interesting looks from um, UCSD where I work, and this was 500 team members, and I said, between power over and power with, power over being dominate, dominant culture and power with being partnership culture, where do you think you structure your relationships, and then how about your work unit? And they said, wow, we really would like a partner, uh, partnership power with culture. It's 500 team members. They said, but our, our culture itself and how 
our work unit is structured is really more toward power over or domination, and you can see that it's about at three or four. So <laughs> you already figured out that I'm kind of clever about this because I want to ask the leaders next, right? So I asked the leaders, yeah, and they said, yeah, we want to be really partnership-based in power with two, um, and we think that our culture that they create is more around of a five right in the middle. And it's always an interesting thing to look at when you think about culture, because if culture is how relationships are structured and leadership drives culture, then what they want and who they are has become a very different thing. And once we map this out and we could put it on the table and talk about it is when we could really create change. Because remember, we started out thinking we want results in quality, safety, uh, experience, but we weren't getting the results we wanted. Now that we're able to talk about culture and talk about those scary things like relationships, bullying, lateral violence, power differentials, isms, we can get the results that we really, really wanted. So just a reminder, my second favorite slide, that how we experience each other is really how our patients experience us. So instead of thinking, this is innovative thinking, but instead of thinking about um, patient experience, think about the culture you create and inviting a patient into that culture, knowing that what you create, then the patient will benefit from it. Um, I did a, a, a pretty interesting thing, and probably my HR people really didn't like me very well, but we were looking at, in one of our acute um, hospitals, we were looking at our patient experience in our um, intensive care units, and it was horrible, Unre less than, worse than unremarkable, and instead of putting in a tactic or a strategy, I just hired the next about 100 nurses I hired, and I didn't hire them based on their, um, what they could do, I hired them based on an empathy scale. So I hired about 150 nurses that had higher levels of empathy than normal. And I put them out on the wards. And in the absence of any other strategy, my patient experience um, was exponentially better than with any other strategy, communication strategy I'd ever tried. I just infused my workforce with empathy. So now at UCSD, we screen um, all of our uh, employees for a certain level of empathy. Now, interesting enough, um, what we know as, about empathy is it lives in a power with culture, um, but we know that when um, nurses and uh, clinicians go to school, they have higher levels of empathy than others, and then when they come out of school, they have lower levels of empathy. So that also tells us something about the culture of our learners. We, want them to come in with empathy and then we promptly beat it out of them. Um, and then when we bring them back, we try to retrain them to have empathy. So in a power over power with culture, in power over cultures is where fear and blame and shame silos live. I do a lot of assessments on culture and um, silos are interesting because silos are very power over because it means I'm hoarding resources, I'm taking care of my own, I'm not, I'm not helping you. Silos are dangerous in healthcare. They're dangerous for our patients. They're dangerous for safety and quality. And then a power with culture has safety and trust, compassion, inclusiveness, empathy, and respect. So how do you start? So today, you're going to get to hear about all these innovations. And I'm hoping that as you're hearing about these innovations, you're also thinking about the kind of culture that you're going to try to put these innovations into. Because here's probably the most important part of all of this, is that in a heavily dominant power over culture, innovation can't live. Because innovation can't live in fear. People won't innovate when they're afraid. They won't do it. So when you start to go back to your organizations and think about how do I measure my culture, Julie, um, I'm going to give you some ideas about measuring. So you already have, there's no good tool to measure straight up culture, but you all have measures that you can think about your culture right now. You have your people at work measures. You probably have um, measures um, of burnout for clinicians. You have patient experience measures. You have safety and quality measures. 
Now, this is what I invite you to do. Because our organizations have little microcultures, and because they have um, different cultures based on how the relationships are structured in those work groups, you can take a look and say, I'm going to do an integrative metric. So you can say, on this, uh, in this clinic or in this ward, I'm going to look at the turnover. I'm going to look at the patient experience. I'm going to look at the incidences of bullying that's been reported, if people aren't too fearful and they even report, which we know is a problem, which then we know how high of a power over culture we have, don't we? That's a very, very, very red flag. So you can measure those things, and you will know your culture. So at UCSD, I measure, I take the patient experience, I take the team member experience, I take our clinician burnout, and I measure them in four categories. Would recommend. So do our, do our um, clinicians recommend us? No. So why would I be so shocked if my patients don't recommend coming to me? Because my team members don't either. What they perceive about quality, how they perceive teamwork, recommend teamwork, quality, and safety. And I run it all together into one data set, and then I put it in locations. And then those locations that have high turnover, um, low safety and quality, low patient experience, then we start working on culture with them. This is a cultural disruption map, which is exciting because most people, when they think about patient experience, they think about tactics. Tactics are great. Strategies are great. Um, they'll only work if you put them in a culture that's ready for them. So these are four disruptive areas that I, that I like to use when I'm disrupting culture. It is very cool, you have to admit, it's very cool to have a, a job where you actually get to disrupt things and people expect you to. Um, these are the four areas I disrupt when I'm doing culture disruption. This isn't usually what you're thinking about when you're thinking about experience, but I want you to look with new eyes and innovate how might you disrupt culture so your new culture can grow and you can get the results you want based on whatever strategy you're putting in place. Leadership is a huge cultural disruptor. Um, what framework do you use for leadership? Do you have leadership development? Word to the wise, young leaders who don't have leadership development will almost always be power over. They don't have other tools. It's not their fault. They just know how to tell people to do things. They're not influential. So if you don't have leadership development, you probably have a more power over leadership style, especially if you have new leaders. Uh, mentoring and coaching, do we have mentoring and coaching? Mentoring and coaching won't exist in a heavily dominant culture because I'm not interested in mentoring you. I just want you to do what I say. And then a meeting structure. Take a look at your meeting structures. Are your meetings that your leaders have? Um, I'm just sitting there talking at people, getting them to do things, or is it interactive? Is it partnership-based? And are you getting the intellectual capital of all your thinking um, and partnering with people so that you can benefit from the, the, your intellectual capital from everybody. So leadership is a great cultural disruptor. Marketing and communication is a huge disruptor. So when I started at UCSD, I had been there probably mm, three weeks, and I went to our marketing and communication area, and when I walked in, and I told this to the surgical registrars, and then I got in all sorts of trouble. So I walked in, and we had made this billboard um, of one of our surgeons, and he's a a big, huge white guy in a white jacket, and he's standing like this, and the camera's like this. And I walked in, and I'm like, oh, that's scary. Where did we put that? And they're like, oh, that's this great billboard of our great surgeon. And I said, well, that's scary. Patients are going to be scared of that. And then everybody's like, you can't say that, because he's like famous. And I'm like, well, can he sit down by people and not look so white coat white? Scary. Um, so that's visual alignment, and that's um, also making sure that your communication looks like who you want it to look like. And at uh, UCSD right now, we have a lexicon or a words matter dictionary where there's a whole bunch of words that contribute to more of a more power over with the patients that we just don't use. We say we can, won't use this. We, we use partnership and relationship to patients. We use collaboration. We don't use to you, we do with you, we don't use for you, just a variety of things. We use visual alignment, we use no stock photos in our marketing. We use real people, real team members to show we value them, and then we make sure our internal and external communication is very aligned. 
Human resources is the best disruption of all times. I love to muck in human resource things. I wouldn't say that human resources always likes me, um, but I like to muck in human resources. I really like to muck with hiring. Don't bother to hire people who don't live your values. Your dance card's probably already full of those. Hire people with high levels of empathy, high levels of caring, people who already like your values. Orientation, make sure your orientation is very clear of who you are and what you're about. And then also make sure that strategies around team management aren't punitive and are really aligned with a respectful workplace. I do have to mention also that I'm a big lover of getting rid of policy and procedures that are um, very power over. I don't know, what do you call no-shows again, Deb? Failure to attend? Failure to attend. So um, we had this no-show policy now, I'm probably gonna say this and then you'll all feel the same way that that surgeon did when I did this. But we had a, like a no-show policy. Like our um, clinicians run very late. We run late, really late. And our no-show policy was if you show up as a patient one minute late, we won't, won't have to see you. But we can be like hours late. And so I said, does this seem right to anyone fair? And everyone's like, oh, that's how we've always done it. I just take a piece of, I just take a, a pencil and go, nope, shh, that one's gone. So you have to look at your policies and say, are they punitive against your patients? If I couldn't find a parking spot, I'm one minute late, I waited three months for this appointment, you're not gonna see me? But you ran three hours late the last five times I came? That doesn't seem right. So I get rid of policy and procedures, and I also am particularly abhorrent to policy and procedures that um, separate families and patients. Um, and we had several of those. Patient, the family can't be in with you, the family can't, and I was just like, seriously? Like, who do we think we are? So you can get rid of those. Um, HR is going to be mad at me if they're in the room because then they'll say, oh my gosh, you want to get rid of all these policies that are like our sacred cows that we love. It's like, get rid of them. Um, and also policy and procedures that are punitive to our team members as well. And then you might have a patient office. We call ours the office of experience. And that's where calls come in, where patients call and complain. Do you have that? You must take patient complaints, yes? Yes, 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 okay. So um, what I found when I looked at our Office of Experience is the people who were taking the patient complaints were, didn't care about those complaints at all and they had lots of reasons that they told us why the patients had no really real reason to complain and they'd, they'd um, outsource their love, do you know what I mean? And I say that like the patient would call to complain about a clinician and they call to complain about a clinician and somebody would cover for them and say that wasn't really real and so we don't do that anymore at all. That's a relationship issue. So if a patient calls and they have and they are sincere and they have a worry, a concern about communication or complaint, we direct it back to the clinician and the team and we ask them if they're able to repair that relationship with that patient, knowing that relationships and how relationships are structured are so important to our work. And if they can't repair the relationship with the patient on the patient end or the clinician end, we find them a new clinician. And that has been extremely eye-opening for our culture because there was no blame attached to it. It was more about can you reestablish a relationship that's gonna be healing so the patient can adhere to their treatment plan, the family can trust you, and if not, we have to find a new relationship for you. So those are my um, very big, uh, wild cultural disruptors. I usually do this for about a year before I do put in any other um, strategies. So, is it too odd? Is it innovative enough? Does it make sense? You're very quiet. It's very worrisome to me. Have you ever had the issues? Because where this was all born from, remember, was I was working with patient experience. And what I found is the strategies I was putting in to improve patient experience, the people who were taking care of the patients either hated, resented, or didn't care about doing. And that doesn't work. I was at this, I went to this meeting and it, we were there with some of the technicians and the manager said, our technicians don't greet the patients appropriately. And so I was listening intently. He said, so we're writing them up. Some of them were firing. And I said, you realize you won't punish people into loving our patients, don't you? And he just looked at me, and I knew he didn't realize that. He didn't realize it. So I said it again. You realize you won't punish people into loving. And he just 
He had no other skill. He didn't know how else to do it. He didn't know how to shift his culture. Um, so that's a good takeaway as you start to look at all the innovations um, from today that you get to see is that in our culture, if there's too much fear attached uh, to your culture and too much fear, and if you're in a leadership role, you don't know it, so you're going to have to ask about it. You won't know. Be okay with that. If you're a leader, Deb and I have had this conversation. If you're a leader and you think everything looks fine from up there, um, you can keep the results you have. Um, but look deep. You can ask people. And what we really know that's really exciting is as soon as we talk about, I'll go back, as soon as we talk about this, and as soon as I show you this, and especially as soon as I show you this, this one, as soon as I show you this, and I've done a lot of good studies on this, you're already changed. You're already changed because you have context for culture. You didn't know you could talk about culture. You didn't know why your stomach felt sick when you were in certain cultures, why you left some jobs because you couldn't stand them and you didn't have a context. But now you know. It's too high of a power over culture. I don't like the stories people tell about our patients. Too high of a power over culture. We're having a lot of turnover. Um, the employees don't want to work there. They have someone that's an employee that nobody else wants to work with. Too high of power over culture. And your goal in healthcare is to move our cultures where they're supposed to be, which is toward partnership, which is toward the kind of cultures, because that's where healthcare should be, right? That are safe, that have trust, so we can have good safety and quality, that are compassionate, so our patients adhere to their treatment plans, and they know we care about them, so they do what we ask them to do, and we're inclusive, because we have a lot of diversity, and we have to take care of everyone, that we have empathy, and that we have a respectful workplace. So when we meet at UCSD, we tell people, can you try to move your relationships that way? And it works. This is my favorite cultural disruptor, and I'll leave you with this thought. So when I got to UCSD, I looked at our people at work survey, and 30% of our um, employees didn't trust us. 30%, that's a lot. So I said to my executive team, I said, 30% of people don't trust us. And they didn't remember, they're in leadership roles. They go, well, everything looks fine from up here. And I said, we're going to need a new strategy. So we did a strategy called Leading the Way. It's our number one cultural disruptor. We're having great, um, amazing results with it. And what we did is we decided our leaders couldn't sit in big rooms like this and learn. They had to be in small groups. They had to be with their team members that didn't trust them. And we taught them how to run what we call salons, which are about 120 employees. We taught them how to run them. And now we don't do any big leadership development like this. We do all small leadership development, all interprofessional, no name tags that should say what your title is. And all of our executive team teaches them. And um, we've done over uh, 2,000 leaders and team members. We do them four days a week, and we roll out our strategy, which is experience, is our core strategy. We roll out our strategy, we bring our employees in, and we run them, uh, we spend time with them, and we walk them through um, our intentions, which you call values, and we teach them and hear from them about what they think the values are. And um, these are some of the results we've had, and I will tell you, we've done over 2,000 people, and I've only had two negative comments. When was the last time you did a training? and you only had two negative comments with 2,000 people. It's been amazing for us. It's our number one cultural disruption, but remember, we got really smart about working on culture and relationships first. So now, when I wanna roll out a communication strategy or I wanna roll out um, a quality strategy, I have much better look. And people are like, yep, we get it, that makes sense, that it's aligned with our values. Our leaders told us about that, they were there present for us. So this is my um, favorite. Um, number one, cultural disruption. We brought this strategy over and did a little work here last week and got really good results as well. So if any of you want to catch me um, at break, I'm more than happy to tell you how we run those. We call them salons. They're not to get your nails done or your hair done. They're actually um, really relational uh, training. So as you look this today and as you look at all the innovations, I want you to also think about how do you innovate your culture so a new one can grow so that you can get the results in experience, safety, quality, interprofessionality, and cost 
that you really want. Thanks. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of your innovative conference. <laughs>